Journey to the Armstrong Lunar Resort, your ultimate lunar vacation. Welcome to our series exploring the exciting current plans for humanity's return to the moon and the future development of lunar tourism. In this series, we'll delve into the intricate details and ambitious goals of upcoming missions, as well as the visionary concepts for making the moon a destination for space tourists. The series will be divided into 14 chapters, with two chapters featured in each episode. Join us as we embark on this fascinating journey to our closest celestial neighbor, the moon. I dock at the Gateway Station, high above the lunar surface. As the trade hub with Earth and other destinations, Gateway has grown over the years to a mammoth structure with tank farms and landing craft ports, accommodations, and container facilities. I quickly transfer to a lunar lander so as not to get in the way of commerce, and before long I descend to Copernicus Base. The excitement was palpable as we approached our destination. The lunar surface came into view. My heart raced as we descended and the lander gently touched down near the resort. It's midnight, lunar time. Not that it matters much since we all go by coordinated universal time here for convenience. I find myself outside lying down on a specially designed chaise long that accommodates my bulky suit and supports me in the perfect position, looking straight up. Around me, other tourists in my group settle into their own chairs, which are permanently mounted into fixtures embedded in the pad. These chairs are crafted from materials resistant to the extreme heat fluctuations and harsh ultraviolet sunlight of the moon. This observation deck, located outside the big group airlock of Copernicus Base, was specifically designed for this exact moment. The surface of the deck is made of packed and treated regolith, the pulverized rocks and dust of the moon, ensuring stability underfoot. Comfort isn't exactly the word I'd use, but the guides made sure to adjust everyone's seats beforehand to make us as cozy as possible. The outside lights were switched off a moment ago, but I can see just fine. A full earth hangs nearly directly above, casting a gentle blue glow. It's far brighter than a full moon back on earth. As I stare up at earth, I'm momentarily lost in its swirling clouds, vast oceans, and sprawling continents. Then I see it, a small fuzzy black circle slowly crawling across the face of our home world. That's the moon's shadow, moving at over 1,000 miles per hour, faster than the speed of sound. Yet from a quarter million miles away, it seems to creep leisurely. Here, the silence is absolute. No wind, no birds, no insects. Just me, inside my suit, watching the moon's shadow slide across Earth. I block Earth with my hand, and its glare vanishes. The sky around it is black, utterly black, but dotted with a few stars. Given a few minutes to let my eyes adapt, I would see thousands of them, but I've done that before. Lowering my hand, Earth once again fills my view. Minutes later, I notice the shadow isn't passing across Earth's diameter, but cutting a shallow cord. It's still awe-inspiring, even if it's not perfect. And then it's over. The guides help us up since moving in the low gravity is a bit tricky. The miners, more accustomed to this, get up easily and head for the airlock. After a few minutes, I'm standing with the rest of my tour group, everyone smiling, awe lingering in our expressions. We make our way to the airlock, where the guides check our suits and give us an electrostatic zap to remove the regolith dust. The miners are already heading to the shuttles that will take them back to the lunar south pole, back to the shadows, the ice, and their digging machines.
Watching them, a thought strikes me. I am one of the few humans who have ever watched a solar eclipse from this side, seeing Earth from above as the moon's shadow blocks the sun for those below. The airlock closes behind me, sealing off the lunar landscape. It's time for the next adventure. The facility is white and gray, dotted with lights and landing pads. The main feature as I come in for an autonomous landing are the two massive glass domes set to the side of the main base. I disembark onto pressurized buses that will carry you to Copernicus Colony Station and before long are greeted at the Armstrong Lunar Resort by the staff. Each holiday maker has their own suite and toilet, an upshot of years of studying isolated astronauts. It turns out they prefer to be alone when off duty. After a few hours rest, then a suit fitting, I board the lunar bus for our first activity, sightseeing. For some, the journey is more important than the destination. For others, not so much. Stuck in your lunar hotel for a day or two, while you acclimate, you'll inevitably find yourself mesmerized by the panoramic window overlooking the moon's alien landscape. Unlike Earth, the view is an otherworldly panorama of stark beauty with distant mountains and hills punctuated by rugged rocks. From your elevated vantage point, the most striking feature is the vast sea of craters. In some regions, known as the highlands, the craters are so densely packed that every square inch of the surface is part of one crater or another. The craters overlap, with newer ones partially obscuring the older, more weathered ones. These craters are ancient scars from relentless impacts by asteroids and comets, cosmic ice balls that orbit the sun. On Earth, our atmosphere acts as a shield, burning up smaller incoming threats as they streak through the sky at hypersonic speeds, creating the familiar sight of shooting stars. Larger rocks, up to 30 yards across, may make it through, but are usually pulverized upon impact. Erosion processes like wind, water, and tectonics further erase craters over time, leaving Earth with only about 130 known craters. In contrast, the Moon, with its airless environment, preserves these features indefinitely. The Moon's lack of atmosphere allows asteroids and comets to collide directly with its surface at speeds of tens of thousands of miles per hour. The energy released in these impacts can be immense, comparable to nuclear explosions. When larger, mountain-sized rocks strike, the resulting energy can surpass the combined force of Earth's entire nuclear arsenal, creating colossal craters. While the Moon does experience erosion, it occurs much more slowly than on Earth, and in unique ways. The absence of an atmosphere means the Moon's surface undergoes extreme temperature swings, from blistering heat of 250 degrees Faries in the sunlit areas to freezing cold of minus 200 degrees Faries in the shadows. This thermal stress causes rocks to expand and contract, gradually breaking them down over millions of years. Tiny impacts from space debris also contribute to lunar erosion. On Earth, these particles burn up as meteors, but on the Moon, they hit the surface directly, creating microscopic craters called zap pits. Over time, these processes reduce rocks to a fine gray powder known as regolith. Unlike Earth's soil, regolith is a jagged, abrasive material that irritates skin and poses respiratory hazards if inhaled. It's also a bane for machinery jamming moving parts and complicating lunar operations. Despite its challenges, regolith holds potential as a construction material for future lunar bases. Similar to dry concrete, 
It could be sintered or 3D printed into durable structures. providing essential protection against the sun's intense heat, cosmic rays, and micrometeoroids. Early moon bases will likely use prefabricated materials, but future expansions may rely heavily on this abundant lunar resource. As you gaze out from your hotel window, contemplating the moon's ancient, cratered landscape, you'll feel a profound connection to the vast history and untapped potential of our celestial neighbor. This adventure is not just about experiencing the future, but also understanding the remarkable science that makes it possible. As I stepped out of the lander and onto the moon's surface, I was overwhelmed with awe. The landscape was surreal, a mix of gray dust and rocky terrain illuminated by the harsh sunlight. The low gravity made each step feel like a gentle bounce, and I had to adjust my movements to avoid floating too high. The Armstrong Lunar Resort stood nearby, a series of interconnected domes and structures with large transparent panels. Inside the resort, I was greeted by friendly staff who guided me to my room. It was spacious and modern, with a large window offering a breathtaking view of Earth. The sight of our home planet, hanging like a blue and white marble in the blackness of space, was mesmerizing. I spent the first evening acclimating to my new environment and preparing for the adventures ahead. The next morning, I woke up early eager to explore the resort and its surroundings. After a quick breakfast of rehydrated eggs and coffee, I joined a small group of fellow travelers for a guided tour. Our first stop was the observation deck, a large circular room with panoramic views of the lunar landscape. From this vantage point, the stark beauty of the moon was even more apparent. Craters of various sizes dotted the surface, and in the distance, the jagged peaks of lunar mountains cast long shadows. Our guide, a seasoned lunar explorer, began to explain the history of the moon's formation and its geological features. As she spoke, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of connection to the countless generations of humans who had gazed up at the moon in wonder. Now, here I was, standing on its surface, a testament to the incredible advancements in space travel. Next, we suited up for a lunar hike. The suits were designed for comfort and mobility, with advanced life support systems to ensure our safety. As we stepped out of the airlock, I was struck by the absolute silence of the lunar environment. There was no wind, no rustling of leaves, just the soft crunch of regolith underfoot. We made our way towards a nearby crater, marveling at the fine, powdery dust that seemed to cling to everything. At the crater's edge, our guide pointed out the layers of rock exposed by the impact, each one telling a story of the moon's ancient past. We collected samples to bring back to the resort's lab for analysis, a reminder of the scientific importance of our presence here. Back at the resort, we had the opportunity to try out some of the recreational activities designed for low-gravity fun. There was a lunar gym with specially adapted exercise equipment, and even a zero-gravity pool where we could experience the sensation of floating freely. It was an exhilarating reminder of the unique challenges and joys of living on the moon. As the sun set, casting long shadows, and creating an otherworldly twilight, I made my way to the resort's dining area. The chefs had prepared a special meal to celebrate our first full day on the moon, featuring a mix of Earth delicacies and innovative lunar cuisine. We toasted to the spirit of exploration and the promise of future adventures. Later, I retired to my room, 
once again gazing out at the earth, now bathed in the soft glow of moonlight. The sense of wonder and possibility was palpable. Tomorrow would bring new experiences and discoveries, and I couldn't wait to see what the moon had in store for us next. The landing site for Artemis III astronauts isn't set in stone. Scientists are meticulously combing through high-resolution data from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, to find the perfect spot. This data provides incredible views and detailed maps of the Moon's surface, including how lighting changes throughout the lunar year. Key Considerations Sunlight Sites with ample sunlight are crucial for minimizing temperature fluctuations and providing power. Communication. A clear line of sight to Earth ensures smooth mission support. Safe landing. Gently sloped areas with minimal debris are ideal for landing and maneuvering. Water ice potential. Proximity to permanently shadowed regions which might hold water ice is a top priority. The Commercial Lunar Payload Services CLPS, initiative is gathering even more lunar surface data. Robotic scouts like Viper will provide valuable information that will influence landing site selection. The Artemis III lander will carry a treasure trove of scientific tools and equipment, enough for 220 pounds 100 kilograms, of scientific cargo to the surface, with the goal of returning 87.5 pounds 35 kilograms of precious samples. Additionally, pre-positioned equipment from CLPS providers might await the astronauts for their lunar surface studies. During this historic week-long mission, the crew will become lunar geologists. Their main objectives include characterization, studying the regional geology, focusing on permanently shadowed regions if accessible, sample collection, gathering a variety of lunar rocks to understand the Moon's formation history, core samples, drilling into the lunar surface to capture ancient solar wind trapped within the soil, shadowy secrets, comparing samples from inside and outside permanently shadowed regions to understand potential water ice presence and material differences. The crew will call the ascent vehicle of the lander their home during their stay. This is the upper part of the lander that will propel them back to lunar orbit after their surface exploration concludes. NASA plans for at least two moonwalks, but is striving to allocate more resources to spacesuit life support systems to allow for four planned moonwalks with an additional contingency moonwalk in reserve. Here's a breakdown of a typical lunar day, days one, two, four, and five. Dedicated moonwalks for scientific research and technology demonstrations. The latter part of day five will be used for site cleanup. Day three, crew rest, conducting science within the ascent vehicle and engaging with the public. Before venturing out, the crew will meticulously prepare their cabin and spacesuits once on the lunar surface, they'll spend an initial 1.5 hours setting up their work area and unpacking tools. Minimizing lunar dust tracked back into the cabin is also a priority. The following four hours will be dedicated to exciting scientific exploration and technology demonstrations. The crew will always be mindful of staying within a safe distance from the lander in case of any issues. After a successful and historic lunar expedition, the crew will ascend from the surface to reunite with their Orion crewmates in lunar orbit. With their carefully collected moon samples safely secured, they will embark on the three-day journey back to Earth. With Artemis III, America will solidify its position as a leader in global space exploration. This mission marks the return of crewed lunar landings, 
and paves the way for a sustained human presence on the moon, ultimately serving as a stepping stone for future missions to Mars. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next part, which will include Chapter 5, Exploring the Apollo 11 Landing Site, and Chapter 6, The Lunar Lava Tubes. As we conclude this virtual odyssey, we invite you to like and subscribe to our channel to embark on further cosmic explorations. With every click, you elevate our pursuit of knowledge and contribute to the collective understanding of our universe.